I don't know who you are. Welcome to The Suggestion Box, a video series in which I suggest things to you. For example, pieces of media or various trains of thought that you might want to examine, re-examine, discover, or avoid. Today's episode is about how we imagine, identify, and describe selfhood. And it's about why our concepts of self would benefit from being expanded. Now, we've got to get one thing straight right off the bat. The idea of selfhood is a construct. This does not mean that selfhood is not real, it just means that the ways in which we talk about it are constructed, and the concept itself is constructed. This implies that it can be deconstructed and reconstructed. There's a common misconception about what we mean when we say things are constructs, things like gender or race and so forth. It's easy to dismiss this notion by pointing at the very real ways in which gender and race manifest in the world, but that is missing the point. Of course, gender and race are real, but they are still constructs. If a physical example would help, think of something like a bridge. A bridge is constructed, but of course the bridge is real. To say that it is constructed does not take away from the physical, economic, and logistical reality of the bridge and of how we interact with it. It is only a way of pointing out that the bridge's existence in the world is contingent rather than necessary. In other words, in some alternate universe, it's conceivable to imagine that the bridge perhaps has not been built, or at least that it has been built quite differently. The same, I would argue, is true of our sense of selfhood. It could be built differently. A neuroscientist named Anil Seth puts it this way. That are put together in various ways so that, I mean, we're familiar, all of us, from books of visual illusions we have when we're kids. We're all familiar with the idea that the way we experience the outside world is not some veridical, direct representation of an objective, unambiguous state of affairs. But the same seems equally true of our experience of being a self. There is no unambiguous external state of affairs that is yourself. It's just a process of continuous, ongoing construction. So if selfhood is a construct, then we should ask ourselves which constructions of self are more or less helpful than others. Remember, as I mentioned in my video on apathyism, a concept or a narrative being artificial doesn't necessarily make it bad, right? there can be healthy or unhealthy ways to tell the same story. I want to look at our constructions of self in two broad categories, internal and external. I know these categories are reductive, maybe oversimplified, but for our purposes today, I hope the distinction will be helpful. What I mean when I say internal construction of self is that we define ourselves by looking inward. This, I think, is the most common way in which the self is defined. We want to believe that the thing that makes us us, the thing that makes you you, and the thing that makes me me, is deep inside of us. Selfhood, when defined this way, becomes a private, subjective thing that can only be described in some vague metaphysical way, located in our minds, or our souls, or whatever we want to call it. Needless to say that this sort of definition of selfhood is limited, and hard to express with any degree of precision, and it relies on a lot of assumptions. You should never assume, because when you assume, you make an ass of you and me. Let's talk about two of those assumptions. The first assumption on which this kind of selfhood relies is the assumption that your mind is one relatively insulated thing, one discrete individual entity or experience or unit that in some fundamental way is autonomous and distinct from the rest of the universe. But this isn't necessarily right. Or at least there are other models of what a mind really is that might serve us better. Enter a philosopher of metaphysics named Andy Clark and a cognitive scientist named David Chalmers who wrote a seminal work called The Extended Mind in 1998. In their paper, they argued that what we think of as our mind could potentially include bio-external structures and events, or in other words, things that are outside of the limits of skin and skull. Consider the way we use smartphones, or even a pen and a pad of paper, as a sort of extension of our cognitive processes beyond the neurological, thinking beyond the body. Don't you get it? I want to go on a date! Here is a brief snippet of Andy Clark in his own words defending his thesis. It's just to raise the question, why should the boundaries of the brain be some sort of magical membrane outside of which um, stuff doesn't count as cognitive? but inside of which it does count as cognitive. Because if you think about the kinds of 
the kinds of role that stuff outside the, the head can play, then it seems rapidly clear that if something inside the head was playing that role, then very often we would regard that as part of cognition. Now, to be fair, in the scientific and philosophical communities, Clark and Chalmers and their theories are considered somewhat radical, so it's understandable if all of this seems like a bit of a stretch. But a less radical theory known as embodied embedded cognition suggests something remarkably similar, namely that intelligent behavior emerges from the interplay between brain, body, and world. That the world is not only a setting in which the brain is acting, but it is a co-agent alongside brain and body. All three contribute to what we think of as a cognitive process, or in simple terms, what we think of as our mind at work. All of this is to say that there are robust theoretical frameworks out there which suggest that what you call your mind might be much bigger than just a network of sparks on a gray mush of flesh inside your skull. Maybe your mind could include a scribble of notes or a line of code with which you've outsourced some cognitive processes like a to-do list app on your phone, etc. Maybe in some way your mind could even include relationships with other individuals, people you rely on to remember things for you, people who finish your sentences. Yeah, it's a little bit more like me. It's like we finish each other's sandwiches. Sentences. Why would I say sandwiches? That time I was going to say sandwiches. <laughs> The second assumption on which an internal construction of self relies is the assumption that your soul is some kind of metaphysically disparate entity, a relatively insulated thing that in some fundamental way is autonomous and distinct from the rest of the universe. But much like we have seen with larger concepts of the mind, there are also larger concepts of an expanded or at least embedded soul. Consider this passage from chapter 4 of Rube Goldberg Machines, a compilation of essays by the contemporary theologian Adam S. Miller. He says, Just as bodies depend on the flow of air, food, and sensation that pass through them, spirits depend on the flow of ideas, emotions, and desires that are channeled by them. Mind and heart bleed out into the world, and the world bleeds back into our hearts and minds. In another part of the book, he writes that, quote, everything borrows from everything else in giant, intermittently harmonious rounds of exchange, compromise, and negotiation. Leaves borrow light, cows borrow leaves, people borrow cows, worms borrow people, etc. The world is the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Everyone's a broker and the closing bell never gets rung, close quote. What Miller is getting at here with these somewhat poetic metaphors of exchange is the notion that your soul, if you have one, is deeply connected to everything else, that it is in constant interaction and intercourse with the rest of the universe, and that the boundary between an individual and the cosmos is probably much more like a membrane than like a wall. So to put these thoughts together from Clark and Chalmers and Miller, I think it's clear that the boundaries of our mind and of our soul could be bigger than we think they are. Is it possible then that our sense of identity and selfhood in general might also be bigger? At the very least, we can productively think of selfhood as a larger mechanism than just our own internal subjective thoughts and feelings and experiences and memories, right? All of this, of course, begs the question of how an external sense of self might even manifest as opposed to an internal one. To reuse the metaphor from earlier of a bridge that can be constructed differently, how would this reconstruction even work? What would it look like? Would the bridge still be functional? Would it be recognizable? Is it a fool's errand to try to define our individuality in non-individualistic terms? Before I try to answer these questions, I think we should take a step down out of the theoretical clouds and talk about some practical application. Because frankly, I didn't sit down to write this episode only as a philosophical exercise. There are very serious real world ramifications of this stuff. To illustrate what I mean, I'm going to talk about Liam Neeson and Aziz Ansari. I should warn you now that the stories I'm about to tell are disturbing and contain potentially triggering descriptions of racially violent ideation and of sexually aggressive behavior. So if you want to skip past that sort of content, feel free to fast forward to the timestamp on your screen. 
Liam Neeson, as I'm sure you're aware, is a renowned actor known for taking on roles with a degree of gravitas. For example, I've played Rob Roy McGregor, Michael Collins, Oscar Schindler, Zeus, for God's sake. And in the past decade or so, he has gravitated towards grizzled, brutal, vengeful characters who wreak havoc on hordes of faceless bad guys or wolves. About six months ago, Neeson offered a pretty shocking confession in an interview with The Independent. He was asked about how he got into character for his action thriller, Cold Pursuit. And he started talking about the kind of primal rage that feeds into violence and revenge. He wanted to explain that as a performer and as a human being, he understands this sort of rage on a deep level. Listen to the story he tells to get his point across. And she told me she had been raped, but she handled the situation of the rape in the most extraordinary way. But my immediate reaction was, I asked, did, they, did she know who it was? No. What color were they? She said it was a black person. I went up and down areas with a cosh, hoping I'd be uh, approached by somebody. I'm ashamed to say that. And I did it for maybe a week, hoping some black bastard would come out of a pub and have a go at me about something, you know, so that I could kill him. Later in the interview, Mr. Neeson speaks more about how horrible he feels about having done this thing. He fully recognizes not only that it was not okay, but that he had clearly fallen into a state of mind that was deeply disturbingly wrong. Before relating this story to selfhood, let's talk about actor slash writer slash comedian Aziz Ansari, best known for his successful career in stand-up comedy, his work on the sitcom Parks and Recreation, and his acclaimed Netflix show Master of None, which he co-created with Alan Yang. The controversy around Ansari began in January of last year, when a woman using the pseudonym Grace accused him of sexual misconduct in an article that described his behavior in great detail. Grace and Aziz went on a date after meeting and flirting at the 2017 Emmy Awards. She says that he wouldn't let her move away from him, that he repeatedly stuck his fingers down her throat, that he continued to sexually escalate despite her several attempts to tell him she was uncomfortable. She says he was aggressive and forceful in his kisses. She finally got an Uber to leave his apartment, but at that point, as she recalls, she already felt violated, and she says she cried the whole ride home. When Aziz reacted to the story, he indicated that the date felt very different to him, and he said he was surprised and concerned to learn of Grace's discomfort. He slipped out of the limelight for over a year, and in his most recent Netflix special, he opens with a brief monologue about the incident, summing up his feelings with this. There's times I felt scared. There's times I felt humiliated. There's times I felt embarrassed. And ultimately, I just felt terrible. And this person felt this way. Now, I focused on these two stories for a reason. I think Liam Neeson and Aziz Ansari exemplify a really interesting part of the discourse because the public reaction to these stories has been mixed and messy. It's clear that these cases aren't as simple and black and white as some others seem to be, and I think the reasons why have a lot to do with our notions of selfhood. It's hard to pin Liam Neeson down as an evil racist monster and be done with it, the way most of us can easily do with someone like David Duke or Richard Spencer or other examples of obvious outright white supremacists. But it's hard to completely exonerate him, too. Similarly, even though Aziz Ansari's story has been situated in the context of the Me Too movement, it's also hard to pin him down as an evil, abusive monster and be done with it, the way most of us can easily do with someone like Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein, or other examples of obvious, outright sexual predators. But here's where the expanded model of selfhood comes in. When we ask questions like, is Liam Neeson a racist? We're asking a pretty tricky question. Because most people, as I noted earlier, think of the self as a sort of contained, subjective, internal kind of thing. In other words, if the question of Liam Neeson's racism is also a question of his identity and selfhood, then it feels like a fundamentally unanswerable question, because none of us are inside his mind and his soul in that internal, subjective kind of way. 
In other words, if when we say the word racist, we're just talking about the internal feelings he has about other people, then it's kind of a useless question. We simply can't know. Likewise, when we ask questions about Aziz Ansari's character, like whether he's quote-unquote one of the bad ones, if we're really just asking about the internal, subjective part of his identity and selfhood that only he has access to, then by definition we're asking questions that we probably cannot answer. Fire! That's it. Go to your room. Now. However, what happens to these questions if we expand our notion of selfhood beyond the limits of skin and skull? What happens if we treat racism as a phenomenon that exists in a system rather than just as a seed of enmity that sprouts in an individual's heart? What happens if we treat sexual misconduct as symptomatic of larger dynamics of gender and power as a part of a system rather than just as a personal moral failing that exists in a vacuum? I'm not suggesting here that we throw individualism and notions of individual responsibility out the window, and I'm not suggesting that all of us are merely cogs in some huge machine that we have no control or power, and that we therefore should be let off the hook for our behavior. Instead, I'm sort of suggesting the opposite. Rather than being let off the hook, I think if we better recognize the complicated way in which our selfhood interacts with the world, then we should hopefully take more responsibility, not less. Because with an expanded model of self, our circle of responsibility is now much bigger than just the feelings and thoughts of which we're immediately aware. All of which is to say, we should own up to the monstrosities we inflict on the world, even the ones we don't intend or the ones we don't understand. And we should own up to the ways in which we are monsters, even if we don't feel monstrous. I accept who I am. And who are you? I'm the bad guy. Just because you think there aren't any overtly racist or sexist or homophobic feelings in your heart does not excuse you from being complicit in racism and sexism and homophobia, etc. To put it in super simple terms, the thing that you are is bigger than the stuff that you feel. This is where men like Liam and Aziz are particularly relevant, because if we just want to know whether they feel sorry for what they've done, whether they feel the introspection and regret that quote-unquote good people ought to feel, then yeah, they probably pass that test. We can't know for sure because we can't occupy their minds, but they seem to be remorseful about their actions. What I'm arguing is that that can't be the only way in which we identify who they are and what their place is in the world. The thing that they are is bigger than the stuff that they feel. Which is to say that if Aziz Ansari still makes women feel unsafe, that's part of his story now, whether he wants it to be or not. If Liam Neeson makes people of color feel unsafe, that's part of him now too. It doesn't need to be infinitely or irrevocably damning necessarily, but it shouldn't be ignored. When President Trump singles out congresspeople of color and tells them they should go back to the broken and crime-infested places from which they came, and when his supporters chant about Elon Omar, send her, back, send, her back, send her back, send her back, send her back, it doesn't really matter if these folks have black friends or if they think there isn't a racist bone in their body, whatever that means. By the way, everyone always says, I don't have a racist bone in my body, but how do we know racism is in the bones, huh? Maybe it's in your spleen. We don't know. It could be anywhere. <laughs> because racism isn't in the bones. It's not in the body. It's in the world. And if part of how you interact with the world is to traffic in rhetoric that has racist history, then the thing that you're doing is racism. The thing that you are in that moment, at least, is a racist. And all of this applies to you and me as well. If my neighbors and friends are stressed about me because of my actions or the ideologies that I espouse or the way that I behave, guess what? That's part of who I am. I don't get to decide that it isn't. For the most part, when someone informs me that I'm being a jerk, it's really not up to me to say that they're wrong. Of course, there are limits to this, and I'm not advocating for a total abdication of all self-identifying processes to the masses, because, of course, there are times when people will be wrong about you, times when your internal sense of self might be better calibrated than the social one is. Of course, not all sources of information about who and what you are should be treated equally. But 
I think, in general, we should all recognize that the core of our identity, of our personhood, of our selfhood, is bigger and more expansive than we think it is. We need to recognize that the thing that makes you you and the thing that makes me me exists in a larger space than just our heads and our hearts. Our identities exist in the world. If we were to recognize this, we might be less defensive when we get called out for bad behavior. When we are criticized, we might amend our self-definitions instead of treating the criticism like it's a personal attack. And we might end up with a much healthier, more robust, more honest view of who we really are. <laughs>